Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're beginning a brand new series entitled the QME Top 10. The QME Top 10. And in this series, we're going to have frank, open, and unrestricted discussion about some of the most pressing issues, the most pressing concerns, and the most pressing confusions that qualified medical evaluators are struggling with. And uh, let me just uh, tell you a couple words about how this series came to be. Uh, over the past uh, 90 days or so, uh, I've been doing basically what I do. And for those of you that know me, uh, you, we may have had a phone conversation or exchanged emails in the past. But I communicate on a regular basis with a large number of QME doctors who call me up and ask me to help them troubleshoot various issues with their QME examinations and their QME reports. And so I have the opportunity to uh, review a high volume and a large number of cases, much more than I would have the opportunity if I was simply involved with my own cases. So because I uh, find myself involved with many, many doctors' cases, I decided to take some notes about some of the concerns that qualified medical evaluators are having. And over the past 90 days, uh, I took copious notes on each phone call, on each email exchange, on each QME report that I had the opportunity to review, and I came up with what I referred to as the top 10. And so these are the top 10 issues and concerns that qualified medical evaluators are reporting to me over and over and over again. And it's quite interesting because uh, I come to realize that the number of issues, concerns, and questions that we have uh, is actually not an infinite number, but it's actually a finite number. And what I've been able to uh, identify are the recurring themes that QMEs are uh, exposed to and that QMEs are struggling with, regardless of the type of work that you do, regardless of your specialty, and regardless of your locale. It's actually a very finite number of concerns that we're all struggling with. So I decided to create a series to address the top 10 concerns. And let me just share with you uh, the topics uh, that we'll be discussing in this series. Today in part one, uh, we're going to go over some discussion regarding pinch and grip strength testing. This is going to be a fascinating discussion for you. In our next section, we're going to talk about uh, physical examination instruments and why it's absolutely critical, critical that you uh, outfit your doctor's bag with the test instruments, the physical examination test instruments, exactly as they're described in the AMA guides. In our third session, uh, we're going to talk about apportionment. And I'm going to give you some ideas on apportionment that will forever simplify your apportionment determination. It seems that a high volume of the calls that I get from QME doctors involve struggles with the apportionment determination, and I understand that. I get it. Apportionment has to be done exactly correctly, and your apportionment opinion has to qualify as substantial medical evidence, and that's actually quite a tall standard. So many doctors' opinions on apportionment fall short of meeting that standard. So I'm going to give you some ideas on apportionment that will forever simplify your apportionment determination. Uh, in our fourth session, we're going to talk about uh, the value or the lack of value <laughs> of electrodiagnostic testing. And I'm going to attempt to convince you to reduce or completely eliminate uh, your referrals for electrodiagnostic testing. In our fifth session, we're going to talk about report writing mastery and how to improve the content and the quality and the clarity uh, of your QME reports. It's interesting, and that is that report clarity, report clarity comes from thinking clearly or thinking clarity. And many doctors uh, do not have their thinking clear before they put their thoughts into the written word on paper. And it becomes difficult for the reader of the report to understand 
exactly what it is the doctor's trying to say. Well, I have a solution for you, and I call it the topic headline formats. Topic headline formats. And I'm going to give you some headline formatting to use to help you to organize your ideas first in your own head and then to present them to the reader of the report on paper in such a way that your opinions and conclusions are clear and that your opinions and conclusions are irrefutable. This is going to be a fascinating uh, and valuable discussion for you. In our sixth session, we're going to talk about uh, subjective versus objective findings. And I'm going to show you uh, and review with you some cases, some actual cases, where qualified medical evaluators have provided for permanent impairment in the presence of a completely normal physical examination. What I'm saying is that the examinee presented with a completely normal physical exam. There were absolutely no objective findings. And yet the qualified medical evaluators were able to provide for generous permanent impairment ratings, even in the presence of a completely normal exam, <laughs> if you can believe that. So this is a new trend that's uh, sweeping the industry. And I'm going to show you uh, exactly how uh, these qualified medical evaluators were able to pull that off. Uh, in our seventh session, we're going to talk about the rising number of cumulative trauma claims, the increase in CT claims. And if you think back about uh, some of the cases that you've had over the past 60 to 90 days, uh, even in those cases that involve a specific injury, you'll notice that the applicant attorney is also filing a tandem or simultaneous cumulative trauma claim. And the cumulative trauma claim can extend for a variable period, anywhere from a year to two years, and I've even seen them extend as far back as five years if the examinee has been with the same employer uh, for that length of time. So if you've noticed this phenomenon, you might be wondering, well, what's the increase in cumulative trauma claims? What's going on here? What's the strategy here? What's the philosophy behind this? And so I'm going to share with you uh, uh, some philosophy on that. In our eighth session, we're going to talk about uh, examinees who uh, appear to be stacking disabilities. And let me just ask you, uh, in the past three to six months, have you had any examinees who were simultaneously receiving workers' compensation benefits, state disability benefits, Veterans Administration benefits, Social Security disability benefits, long-term disability benefits, in other words, are stacking and pyramiding disabilities. Do you have any of those cases? I myself have had several of those cases, and I've consulted with several doctors who also have had several of those cases. So we're seeing examinees who are stacking and pyramiding disabilities. So I want to show you how to handle that, and I want to show you how the workers' compensation injury fits into the larger spectrum of the overall disability claim. Okay, and that's going to be a fascinating discussion for you. Uh, in our ninth session, we'll talk about uh, compensable consequences. And uh, just like the rise in cumulative trauma claims, we're also seeing a rise in the number uh, of claims for compensable consequence injuries. I myself, I just had a case last week where the examinee was uh, claiming compensable consequence for a right shoulder injury. She was claiming compensable consequence to the cervical spine and then also to the left upper extremity. So some of these compensable consequence uh, claims make sense and some of them uh, make no sense at all. So I'll share with you uh, some philosophy on how to uh, determine which is which. <laughs> and then finally, uh, in our 10th session, and this is, uh, seems to be uh, a choke point for many doctors, uh, they don't understand what's going on. And that has to do with failed treatments, failed treatments. Many of the examinees that we're seeing uh, have been through exhaustive uh, medical treatments. They've been through conservative treatments, they've been through invasive treatments, they've been through aggressive treatments, they've been through medication treatments, they've been through physical therapy treatments, they've been through chiropractic treatments and injection treatments and treatments, treatments, 
and they've had exhaustive <laughs> medical treatments. And yet, at the permanent and stationary evaluation, they're no better. They're unimproved. They continue to have symptoms and reports of activity limitations. And the questions that doctors are asking is, how can this be? How can an examinee fail to improve uh, when they've had quality care, competent care, appropriate care, reasonable care, adequate time? How is it that workers' compensation cases uh, seem to have failed response to treatments? And if failed response to treatment is the norm, how can we predict those patients who we can expect to respond to treatment, and how can we differentiate them from the examinees or patients who are never going to respond to treatment no matter how much or what kind of treatment uh, is provided. So I have a fascinating series of controversial topics and uh, this is going to be a no holds barred series where we're just going to open the door and have unrestricted communication and we're going to talk just as if we were uh, in a hotel uh, perhaps having a dinner or a couple of drinks. We're going to have completely unrestricted uh, conversation. Now it's my opinion uh, that uh, these are discussions that you cannot find anywhere else. You're never going to go to a seminar, you're never going to have another speaker talk to you uh, about these controversial topics in a no holds barred uh, open doors format. So these are going to be some extremely valuable discussions that really come from up to the moment concerns that I'm learning about from you out in the trenches. So it's my hope and opinion, uh, it's my hope uh, and intention that this will be an extremely valuable series for you. So we're going to be, uh, we're going to begin today <laughs> by talking about uh, pinch and grip strength testing. And uh, I'm going to review with you uh, some references from the AMA guides. So uh, I'd like to have you uh, take a minute and go ahead and get your AMA guides and make sure that you actually do get your AMA guides because I'm going to be reviewing some citations and I want you to be able to follow along uh, with me as we go through these critical citations from chapter 16. So uh, I'll give you a minute to go ahead and get your AMA guides and then I look forward to being right back uh, here with you in just a couple minutes as we begin part one of our new series on the QME Top 10 and today we're focusing on pinch and grip strength testing. with me. I hope you have your AMA guides with you as well because we're going to go through some specific citations and I think it's important that you lay your own eyes uh, on these citations. That you lay your own eyes on these citations as we go through them. I uh, also have a couple of instruments here. I have my JMAR dynamometer for grip strength testing and also my hydraulic pinch gauge, also a JMAR instrument, and we'll be talking about uh, the uses of these instruments in just a couple minutes. So let me establish the philosophy of today's discussion, and that is we're talking about grip and pinch strength testing. Now pinch and grip strength testing is described in chapter 16 of the AMA guides with regards to evaluation of permanent impairments of the upper extremities. So many doctors perform grip and pinch strength testing. Many doctors perform pinch and grip strength testing as part of their cervical spine exam. I think they consider it part of a neurologic evaluation of motor function of the upper extremities, but nowhere in chapter 15 of the AMA guides is grip strength testing discussed in relation to the evaluation of permanent impairments 
of the cervical spine. It's only discussed in chapter 16 with regards to the upper extremity. So if you're doing pin, uh, pinch and grip strength testing, that's okay. That's okay. But it needs to be limited to upper extremity injury cases. It has no bearing uh, and no relationship to evaluation of permanent impairment, say for example, due to cervical radiculopathy. It's not described in chapter 15, it's described in chapter 16 for the evaluation of neuromusculoskeletal injuries of the upper extremity. So that's one thing. Limit your use of grip and pinch strength testing to upper extremity claims and upper extremity cases. Now, with that established, it's my opinion, and I'm going to provide uh, as much support for this opinion as I can. It's my opinion that even though uh, grip and pinch strength testing is described in the AMA guides, the AMA guides basically tell us that even though we describe this here in this chapter, uh, there's probably actually very, very little use. <laughs> very, very little use and very, very little applicability of grip and pin strength testing. So let me share some of those references uh, with you. In addition to those references from the AMA guides which discourage us from using pinch and grip strength testing and which tell us that pinch and grip strength testing really is uh, only remotely, only remotely applicable. I'm going to share with you some other reasons as to why uh, pinch and grip strength testing uh, has really no value for us in the permanent impairment evaluation. I'll share several uh, reasons and several examples with you. Well, let's begin now in chapter 16 uh, on pages 508, 509, yep, yeah, 508 and 59. So please turn your AMA guides to 508 and 59, which I have printed out here so that it's easier for me to read. So let's talk about some of the principles that the AMA guides uh, describe with regards to uh, pinch and grip strength testing. And this is on page 508. It says, in a rare case, this is under section 16.8 principles, says, in a rare case, now let me ask you, how often is rare? <laughs> it says here, it says, in a rare case, how often is rare? Is rare the same as often? Rare is rare. It says here, in a rare case, if the examiner believes the individual's loss of strength represents an impairing factor that has not been considered adequately by other methods in the guides, the loss of strength may be rated separately. So what they're telling us is that for upper extremity injuries, we may see loss of strength, but that loss of strength and the impairment of the upper extremity uh, is best described using other methods in the AMA guides. So what are the other methods of rating impairment of the upper extremities? Well, we have amputations, we have digital nerve lesions, we have abnormal motion, we have peripheral nerve disorders, we have vascular disorders, we have the category referred to as other disorders, and then finally, finally, we have loss of strength. The AMA guides tell us that strength rating impairments are to be used rarely, and the other methods are to be used commonly. Okay? Now, they give us an example. They say, for example, uh, an example of this situation, meaning a situation where the impairment is not adequately captured using the other methods for which we can use the loss of strength as the primary method. It says an example of this situation would be the loss of strength due to a severe muscle tear that, le that healed leaving a palpable muscle defect. Okay, loss of strength due to a muscle tear that's, that's left a palpable muscle defect. This is an impairment that cannot be rated 
according to the other methods. So in this case, we have loss of strength to capture the permanent impairment. Okay? So if that's an example, what are some other examples that you can think of where the impairment is not captured by the other methods and for which we can then default to the loss of strength method? Well, as you're coming up with your list of possible anatomic conditions, the guides give us a couple of warnings about when we cannot, when we cannot use grip, uh, grip and pin strength testing to capture the impairment. They tell us that whatever condition you're thinking of, they tell us that the loss of strength cannot be rated in the presence of decreased motion, painful conditions, deformities, or absence of parts. For example, a thumb amputation that prevent effective application of maximal force in the region being evaluated. Okay, so let's put this in perspective. They tell us that mm, we can occasionally or rarely use loss of strength uh, for those conditions where the impairment cannot be captured by the other methods. So what are some of those conditions? Well, those conditions, that list of conditions that you're thinking of, which I'm having trouble coming up even with examples, uh, become filtered and disqualified if they involve loss of motion, if they involve any pain at all, any pain at all, Okay, so that eliminates probably mostly everything. Deformities or absence of parts, and they use a thumb amputation as an example of an absence of part. Well, what's another example of an absence of part? How about a resection of the distal clavicle? Many times uh, for rating shoulder impairments, we don't use pinch and grip strength testing, but we use manual muscle testing for the assessment of strength, but the guides tell us that in the absence of parts, such as resection of the distal clavicle, permanent impairment due to loss of strength is disqualified. Is disqualified. Would you consider a carpal tunnel syndrome a resection or a transection of the flexor retinaculum? Would you consider that an absence of part? Would you consider that a deformity? It could, couldn't it? Well, whether it's disqualified due to deformity or absence of part, in the presence of any pain, the strength test, strength rating is also disqualified. So in this section, the AMA guides tell us basically, they basically are telling us that there's not a whole lot of application for grip and pinch strength testing. Not a whole lot. Does that mean that you cannot use it? No, it does not mean that. But it means that you have to satisfy very specific criteria in order to demonstrate the applicability of loss of strength to your particular examinee. So that's one uh, set of information that largely disqualifies the use of strength, uh, of pinch and grip strength ratings for permanent impairment. I want to go over uh, another set of uh, uh, ideas and information with you that, in my opinion, uh, disqualifies uh, grip and pinch strength testing and permanent impairment due to loss of pinch and grip strength. And this has to do with the charts and tables on page 509 that give us what we refer to as our normals, our normals against which we um, compare our examinee. So these are tables 1631, 1632, 16, and 1633. Okay? So if you have your AMA guides, please turn to page 509 and look at each of these tables. Now, you'll notice that the reference for these tables, for each of these tables, is the same. This material comes from a 1970 study uh, by Swanson published in the Bulletin of Prosthetics 
research from 1970. <laughs> now, this video is being recorded in 2016. This study, these normals, were established 46 years ago. <laughs> 46 years ago. Now, let me ask you, what was different uh, 46 years ago compared to today? And the answer to that is everything. <laughs> everything was different 46 years ago. 46 years ago, we didn't have computers. 46 years ago, we didn't have so many mechanized machines. 46 years ago, we didn't have labor-saving devices that do everything for us like we do today. 46 years ago, we had to work. 46 years ago, we had to use our extremities. We barely use our extremities for exertion of strength uh, here in 2016. <laughs> These references are almost 50 years old. Okay? So, it's my opinion and it's my conclusion, and I'm going to give you a little demonstration on this in just a minute, that these normals are not reliable normals that we can compare today's examinee uh, against. These are yesterday's normals, but we're examining today's examinees. Okay? So let me just share with you a little bit of information about this study that was published in the Bulletin of Prosthetics Research. And uh, I printed out this study for you, and it's available uh, as a PDF attachment to today's video. So if you want to retrieve this study, just click the link below the video image on uh, today's blog. Okay, so let me just uh, go over some of the details of this study. This is a study <clears throat> that involved 100 healthy persons, 50 of which were male, 50 of which were female. So they examined 200 hands. And they divided the hands into male and female hands. They divided the hands into dominant and non-dominant hands. And then they categorized the hands uh, by age and by occupation. And they described uh, ages by decade, ages by decade, uh, those hands that were under 20 years old, uh, those hands that were between 20 and 29, 30 and 39, 40 and 49, and 50 and 59. Now it's interesting because uh, many of the examinees that we see in our QME practice uh, are over the age of 59. Uh, I'm going to give an example uh, of a 61-year-old female that I saw about uh, two weeks ago. She's not on the chart. The chart ends at 59. Also, uh, they categorized the hands by occupation. They talked about skilled occupation, sedentary occupation, and the manual occupations, and they came up with the averages across all the occupations. Uh, they assessed grip with a JMAR dynamometer. They assessed pinch uh, with a very different type of instrument that uh, I've never seen, and I bet you've probably never seen, and it's radically different from the instruments that we use uh, in our practice nowadays, such as this JMAR pinch gauge. And so it's my opinion that the pinch strength norms are totally inapplicable to the instruments that we're using in our practice today. And you can see a picture uh, of the various different types of pinch gauges that they used in this study. I have them available for you by printout. These are, uh, this pinch gauge uh, is an instrument that measures uh, 2.2 centimeters, so approximately one inch, by 0.5 centimeters thick. 0.5 centimeters thick, it was a little tiny pinch disc. This is much greater than, than 0.5 centimeters. This is approximately, well, what would you estimate that? Approximately three quarters of an inch. This has in no way has any relationship to the test instrument that was used nearly 50 years ago to come up with the norms that we're trying to rely upon as accurate and adequate norms 
that we compare our current examinees against. Okay. Um, interesting uh, findings uh, is that uh, in this study, uh, they find no obvious differences between measurements made in the morning and measurements made in the afternoon. Uh, they found that uh, with regards to the dominant hand, on average, they found that grip strength of the minor hand was found to be about 5.4% weaker in males and 8.9% weaker in females. In other words, they found that the non-dominant hand was less weak. It was only 5.4% weaker in males and 8.9% weaker in females. It was less weak than they had anticipated. And sometimes uh, there's sort of an unspoken rule that we expect the non-dominant side uh, to be up to 10 to 15 percent weaker than the dominant side. And sometimes we even make our calculations for strength loss index taking that into consideration. But the results of this study found that no, uh, dominant versus non-dominant, there's very little differential, only 5 percent in males and 8 percent in females. Uh, interesting, uh, the strength comparing the dominant to the non-dominant hand seems to have some association with handedness. In this particular study, 12 percent of the individuals were left hand dominant. Well, they studied 100 healthy people. So 12 of them were left handed. I'm left handed, okay? So this is interesting to me. <coughs> Of the left-handed people, eight of them, in other words, 58%, had a stronger grip with their minor hand, with their non-dominant hand. Therefore, they concluded there is less difference in strength of the major and minor hands than has generally been thought. So if you were to examine me, I'm left-handed, and found that my left dominant hand was weaker than my right non-dominant hand, that could be a normal finding. That could be a normal finding for me. That could be a normal finding for a right-handed person. The study uh, tells us that. Um, they found that uh, grip strength for males does not differ significantly by occupation. And if you review uh, table 1631, You'll see that for the skilled occupation, the average grip strength is 47 kilograms. For sedentary, it's 47.2. For manual laborers, it's 48.5. So really not a major uh, difference, regardless of the occupation. Uh, and grip strength for males uh, does not differ significantly by age. So that if you look at table 1632, you'll see that uh, the grip strength values uh, are very close even though the examinees uh, are advancing in age by decades. So uh, 20 to 29, the uh, grip strength for major hand is 48.5. 30 to 39 is 49.2. That's a difference of 0.7 kilograms. Pretty close within measuring error, would you agree? Uh, 40 to 49 was 49 kilograms, a difference of only 0.2 kilograms. Quite close, would you agree? 50 to 59 was down to 45.9. And so that represents uh, probably the most dramatic drop. But for the most part, they're still in the high 40s, the mid and high 40s, uh, even though age is advancing by decades. Now, it's my opinion, and I want you to try this test for yourself. You have your own JMR dynamometer, correct? It's my opinion that these are not representative norms. Now, I cited one reason that they're not representative norms is because these uh, measurements were taken over 50, almost 50 years ago when people were involved in much more arduous uh, physical labors than we're involved with today. Sometimes today, the most... Uh, exertion we get with the upper, upper extremities is using a keyboard or using the remote <laughs> to our Xbox <laughs> or our video game controller, okay? 
So back in the day, these people were working fields, working in factories, and were using their upper extremities. And it's my opinion that these norms that are published in the AMA guides uh, are very impressive, they're very strong, and uh, they're not representative of today's weak people. <laughs> and let me give you an example of that. Okay, if you look at table 1632, and you go to the 50 to 59 uh, age category, you'll see that the uh, average, average grip strength for a male 50 to 59 is 45.9 in the major hand and 43.5 in the minor hand. Now, I'm 54 years old. I fit right in about the middle uh, of this age range. Now, in the day, this study was based on 100 healthy subjects. I consider myself to be a healthy subject. In other words, I have no upper extremity conditions. I have no pain in the upper extremities. There's no reason that I can't apply full strength to the JMR dynamometer and come up with uh, strength testing values that are accurate uh, and that are a true representation of my strength. In other words, I'm a cooperative examinee. I'm going to squeeze this grip strength tester uh, with a full effort. Okay? So let me reiterate that. I'm a healthy subject. I'm 54 years old. I'm in pretty good shape. Okay? I lift weights. I lift weights four days per week. I lift weights with my upper arms. I work my forearms, I work the flexors, I work the extensors, I work the pronators and supinators. I blast these muscles in the gym. I consider my arms to be above average. <laughs> I consider them to be above average. Okay? Okay. So for this test, here's what we're getting. Here's my arms, okay? Would you consider my arms above average? I'm 210 pounds, okay? I'm left-handed. This is my left hand. I'm gonna take the JMR dynamometer, set on position two, and I'm gonna squeeze this and give you a full effort. You'll notice that the instrument is set at zero. Now I want you to notice the exertion and the level of effort that I employ in this testing. And I want you to examine and inspect and observe your examinees for the same level of effort. Okay? I'm going to take this instrument, and I hope you can see the dial, but I'll read to you the, the reading. Now the testing is to be done with the examinee seated, with the elbow flexed 90 degrees, and with the arm unsupported, this would be supported. It's been found that the readings are greater when the arm is unsupported. Perhaps there's some contribution due to the co-contraction uh, of the biceps and the triceps and etc. the elbow stabilizers. Okay? So I'm going to give this a squeeze for you now. Okay? And I hope you can see this. Okay? Here it goes. Here's my squeeze. That is forty nine point five. Now the average is forty five point nine. I'm just a little bit above the average. I find it very difficult to believe that there's uh, fifty percent of people that could squeeze this harder than I today. Now back in the day, <laughs> back in the day. They could because they were much stronger. But I don't believe it can be done today. I believe that today that my effort would probably represent the upper 10th percentile of strength for my age category. Perhaps I'm just flattering myself, but as I told you, I do lift weights in the gym and I do work on my grip strength testing. Okay? Let's do the non-dominant hand. See the gauge? <clears throat> 
that's a 50. Just above the average for the minor hand in someone in my age range. Now, it's my opinion that these are not accurate. These are not accurate because they were taken almost 50 years ago. And uh, they're also not accurate because today's people uh, are not as involved with physical activities as they were, and they're much weaker than they were almost 50 years ago today. And to compare today's examinee against yesterday's normal, in my opinion, uh, is not accurate. And let me give you another example as to why I consider these uh, charts to be uh, not representative uh, of the true strength of today's examinees. Uh, about two weeks ago, I had a female examinee. She was a 61-year-old dentist. Now, 61 years old is not in the chart. The chart ends at 59 years of age. But she was 61. She was a female dentist. She had not worked in over 12 months, just about, uh, just about 12 months. She had not worked in 12 months. Now, dentists are involved in a lot of fine motor manipulations and some power manipulations as well. So I would describe that as uh, an upper intensive, upper extremity intensive uh, profession. Well, the interesting thing about this examinee was that on her dominant right hand, on the middle phalanx of her ring finger, she had an enchondroma. Well, it, it was first diagnosed as an enchondroma. Later, by biopsy, it was diagnosed as a giant cell tumor. And approximately 10 years ago, she had a bone graft implantation on that phalanx. They grafted a piece of uh, bone from her hip. And she did well for about uh, nine years. But recently, in the past year, she's been noticing that this tumor uh, has become activated, has become symptomatic, and has become painful. And I first uh, discovered the pain in that phalanx when I was testing her motor strength of the upper extremities in relation to the cervical spine. So I was testing the C7 nerve root by testing resisted finger flexion. And as I grabbed her flexed fingers with my flexed fingers and pulled, she had a little bit of give way of her strength due to what she reported as pain in the middle phalanx. So I just stored that mentally and I thought, oh, she has pain in the middle phalanx. Well, then it came time to do the grip strength testing. And for the grip strength testing, she was unable to incorporate the ring finger in the overall gripping action. She kind of gave it one of these, where the ring finger, I don't know if you can see that, but I'm holding the ring finger off of the test instrument. Can you see that? She gave it one of those. And her findings, her findings was that she was average 25 kilograms in the dominant hand, 24.66 in the non-dominant hand. The average for a 61-year-old female in the dominant hand is 22.3. 22.3, she did 25 without the involvement of the ring finger. Really just using four of the five fingers. So she scored over 100% uh, for a 61-year-old female. And in the non-dominant hand, uh, average for 61-year-old female is 18.2 kilograms. She scored 24.66. This is a woman who has not used her upper extremities, except for activities of daily living, uh, in any major capacity uh, for over 12 months. And a woman who was unable to incorporate her ring finger into the grip strength, thing, grip, grip strength testing procedure. Now, compared to age-matched and occupation-matched norms, she has greater than 100% grip strength. But would you agree with me that loss of use of one of the fingers involved with gripping would contribute to a loss of strength of the grip? 
<laughs> and yet that's not accounted for uh, in the charts and tables that we have with the AMA guides. So for these reasons, for these reasons, and for the main primary reason that the AMA guides tell us that uh, grip strength testing really has very limited applicability. I'm going to go ahead and go on record and let you know that uh, you can do the grip strength testing in your evaluation and I recommend that you do it in those upper extremity cases that you go ahead and do it but that you not consider the findings on grip strength testing to be a true objective finding. Number one, uh, grip strength testing is largely based on subjective factors such as motivation of the examinee, uh, et cetera, and many other subjective uh, factors. I think they describe it here in the AMA guides. They say that uh, this is on page uh, 607. It says, many subjective or non-measurable factors, including fatigue, handedness, time of day, age, nutritional state, pain, and the individual's cooperation, cooperation further influence strength measurements. Individual's cooperation. And I recently reviewed a report uh, where the individual was a 60-year-old male. He was a 30-year concrete finisher. 30-year concrete finisher. Manual laborer. And he had a uh, right upper extremity injury, his dominant hand. No, I'm sorry, it was a left upper extremity, non-dominant injury. And on his non-dominant hand, his grip strength was 9.2 kilograms. But on his dominant side, dominant side was 20 kilograms, 20. The uninjured, asymptomatic, pain-free, dominant upper extremity was only 20 kilograms. Well, the average for a 60-year-old male is 45.9. He measured in at 20. So what should we do? Should we compare his 9 kilograms? to 45.9, which is the age matched normal in the AMA guides? Or should we compare the nine to the 20, which is his normal? Or should we say that we don't have actual normals against which to compare this individual? Because at 20, on the uninjured, asymptomatic, uninvolved, pain-free, side, he's not even on the chart. This is an example where the individual's cooperation uh, is not certain. So for these and many other reasons, it's my opinion that the findings on grip and pin strength testing are not true objective findings. They're not true objective findings and they're going to be used very, very little for the determination of permanent impairments for upper extremity injuries. Okay, so doctors, uh, that concludes today's discussion on grip and pin strength testing. Uh, in our next session, we're gonna go into uh, session number two of this series, and we're gonna talk about uh, physical examination instruments, and I'm gonna show you uh, which are the most important and critical instruments to have in your doctor's bag. And I'm going to show you uh, many, many different ways to employ those instruments uh, in your permanent impairment evaluation. So I want to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's video. I look forward to being with you on our very next video. And for now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'm wishing you uh, best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.